Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. My name's Aaron Powell. I'm editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris. I'm a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today is money and political speech. Campaign finance is a perennial issue, but much of the argument about it rests on often unexamined assumptions. Is money speech? If it is, can we still restrict its role in politics? If it isn't, what's its relation to political speech? What does it mean to say elections can be corrupted by too much speech? Joining us to discuss this is John Samples, director of Cato's Center for Representative Government and author of The Fallacy of Campaign Finance Reform. Welcome to Free Thoughts, John. Thanks for having me, Aaron. So I was thinking maybe you could start by just giving us a little bit of background on campaign finance, where we are, how we got here. Well, I mean, you've obviously had the problem once you enter the sort of modern age of campaigns over the last century of financing them. And that's brought regulation with it. Going back a century or more, you have the Tillman Act and other acts aimed at anti-corruption, although some people say they were meant to prevent businesses from being shaken down by the, by the government, by public officials. Um, not a whole lot of legislative activity over the middle part of the century. In the 50s, you get some more regulations. In the 60s, you really have the founding of uh, the sort of political science of campaign finance, the study of it and so on, and more discussions about it, uh, as, and particularly as television becomes more important in the second half of the 60s, more money is spent on uh, national campaigns. You get a lot more discussion. But it's really – you don't get comprehensive legislation and really don't have a lot of actual regulations because the disclosure in the earlier kind of Tillman Act and other acts that required disclosure, that was pretty much ignored by federal candidates by the mid-60s. Uh, you really get comprehensive legislation though after Watergate and you get it as – you have some legislation passed in the late 60s before Watergate. It's very interesting legislation that we might talk about. But you get the federal uh, uh, campaign law basically in 1974. You clearly get it in the fall of 1974. You get it because of Watergate. Richard Nixon resigns in August. Uh, and then you get a sort of comprehensive set of contribution limits, expenditure limits, public financing. Uh, in a sense, Watergate – gave the campaign finance reform community everything they wanted. That's what you got in the federal election law. But it implicated First Amendment and so it went to the Supreme Court and that led to uh, uh, the major case of Buckley versus Vallejo. Um, yeah, Buckley v. Vallejo is um, is sort of the framework with we, which we work within when we do campaign finance re uh, regulation reform. Any discussion, John already mentioned contributions and expenditures. That was a distinction made uh, and then sort of solidified by Buckley. Uh, contributions are when you give money directly to candidates and expenditures is when you spend it on your own. And that's a crucial distinction that still exists today and around which a lot of this discussion occurs. Uh, so in when, Buckley – When you spend it – on your own for what? Uh, so if I want to – the difference would be here. I go and give money to you know, candidate Bob Smith and he can do what he wants with it or I can you know, buy a, a sound truck, drive it around and, and spin it on my own and say, hey, vote for Bob Smith. And, and that's where the real crucial issue that first comes into play, uh, which is the relationship between money and speech. And of course, uh, a lot of people um, – sort of like to say money isn't speech and that sort of should end the, a lot of the pro-reform people and that should end the discussion right there. Uh, but it's not exactly the case that they ruled money is speech per se. I don't, John, how would you describe the, the way they, they described it? Yeah, roughly? I think it's a good argument in the sense or an effective argument to say money is speech because people, you know, recognize that it isn't. A dollar bill is not speech and so on. The, the idea in Buckley, which I think is a very sound idea, is that you can affect uh, and indeed limit free speech by uh, regulating the money spent on free speech. So if you, for example, to choose the, a later case, uh, Citizens United case, if you prohibit uh, corporations or other similarly legally established groups Like from, unions. <laughs> what's that? Like unions. Uh, like unions. If you prohibit them from spending money on election campaigns – uh, even though you have other kinds of ways for them to spend, perhaps, 
the problem is you're going to get less speech and you have effectively limited freedom of speech. And this, you know, you have to – the other thing we should mention about Buckley because this rapidly, like everything else in life, becomes a partisan and polarized issue, particularly in the last uh, five years or so. You know, the Buckley court was the – still had many members left over from the uh, – Warren era. It had liberals who joined in this opinion who were concerned about uh, the effects of government because that was still at a point where liberals uh, were thought of as free speech advocates more generally. And so it's a – Buckley was a fairly rapidly written opinion and it's become a sort of foundation stone of our constitution. But uh, it was also in some ways bipartisan and bi-ideological. Bi- and the ACLU was uh, one of the supporters for Buckley. And they also supported the Citizens United decision, which a lot of people don't realize because this is about free speech ultimately. Mm-hmm. So before we turn to these issues of money and speech and kind of the, the deeper questions here, can you just summarize what the Buckley court said? What was – well, the, the whole question is, if, it, if the First Amendment is implicated, if money implicates speech and you have freedom of speech and it's, it's so-called high-value speech, it's political speech, then the question becomes, uh, you know, all of those Watergate-era reforms, do they violate that? That was the Buckley question. And what that, sort of reforms were these? Well, there was three basic ones that survived. Uh, the three basic ones – some one of which didn't survive. There were contribution limits. You could uh, give only so much money to candidates. And then you were also limited by the total amount you could give to parties, state parties, and so on. Uh, then there were expenditure limits. So there were limits on how much a candidate could spend. Uh, and there were, although it wasn't touched on by Buckley, sort of limits on expenditure by other groups. Uh, and then finally, there was a provision for public financing of presidential campaigns, which is that uh, – and it's a very interesting thing. I mean they set up a mechanism whereby people could dedicate part of their taxes to a presidential public financing fund uh, that was fairly controversial at the time. So you had these three questions. Were, were contribution limits legal? Uh, constitutional? Were expenditure limits? And was public financing? And there was other – sets of other issues, but those were the three big ones, I think. And the answers were uh, expenditure limits were unconstitutional because they had a direct relationship on limiting the amount of speech. Uh, Public financing was uh, constitutional because it didn't limit speech. It had the effect, uh, the court said, of increasing speech. And contribution limits were legal because they were not, they sort of implicated a partial speech interest. That is, they were kind of political speech and kind of not because it was this indirect relationship to, that you give to somebody else to, to do the speech. And the other thing was it was just a trade-off argument, basically. Uh, Congress could, in trying to prevent corruption, and corruption is the theme throughout this whole 50 to 60-year period before uh, Buckley, uh, to limit corruption, you could limit the amount of contribution. So the corruption then becomes the sole reason to um, basically limit contributions or and also, you know, other kinds of regulations. The other thing that, that happens is Buckley, the court says explicitly that equality of influence or equality of uh, contributions or whatever cannot be a uh, justified reason, a, a ground for uh, limiting or regulating campaign finance. So from the start, equality is off the board as a, as a major value. And that's very important. Uh, so you know, basically we're talking about if you want to buy a politician in this way that would be corrupting in a traditional sense, what we call quid pro quo corruption, I will give you a contribution and you vote this way in this you know, oil case or oil law or whatever, then that would most likely go through the candidate. Uh, but it, th- so that's why that was limited, of how much an individual person could mm-hmm. give. And then if you wanted to speak on your own, though, like I said, whether it's buy a, a, a audio truck and drive it around, uh, buy your own ad uh, for for your own issues and just speak about those. Uh, clearly, if a government were trying to uh, 
curtail speech, and John mentioned this. There was just a reason why money is so important here. A really good way of doing that would be to limit just money and say, oh, we're not limiting speech. We're going to take away your money. Uh, in one of uh, Scalia's dissent in a later campaign finance case, he said, you know, the, the, the specialization of a modern economy where there are book binders and printers and publishers and people who do different things, uh, if you're trying to prevent speech, it, it gives an opportunity to people who are bent on preventing speech because they could just make books illegal or they could make printing presses cost thousands and thousands of dollars and say, oh, we're not regulating speech, we're just regulating printing presses. Um, so they can't do that. Uh, and of course, the, the direct object of this is to regulate speech. And that's one, one thing that has always upset me for the pro-reform advocates where I say, uh, if this regulating this money didn't stop or curtail speech, you wouldn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this connection between regulating speech and preventing corruption. So what we're not talking about here is outright bribery. When you say giving money to a politician or spending on a politician's behalf, you're not talking about buying him a house or handing him a $100 bill. You're talking about paying for advertising or giving him money that would then be spent by his campaign for yard signs and newspaper ads and such. And, and it's important on the legal side of this to realize that the other end of the, the deal is cut off. That is to say, uh, if I give you money for as a campaign finance contribution and you don't spend it in a normal kind of way for yard signs or mostly for television messages, if, say, for example, we've seen some recent cases, you spend it on a mink coat or a car or something, it's a very serious thing. And actually people go to, to jail for fair – it's a federal crime and you go to jail for fairly long terms when you're ca caught doing it. So essentially the contribution question then becomes, the corruption question becomes, because you're not going to be spending this stuff on private goods, private luxury items. You have to spend it on politics and on your campaign. And then the issue becomes, are you, is there an exchange relationship at some level? And do you give something back for the, the, the contribution? And then that is where most of the argument uh, in the legal framework has gone for the last 40 or 50 years. Yeah, and the framework, when we look at the background assumptions, which is what we're going to mainly focus on today because the, the we, can, we can talk on the policy side about all these specific issues, but the philosophy behind campaign finance reform, starting with Buckley, we start having this idea, which, which John pointed out, we have one type of corruption, which is buying politicians, and then we have this other one, what the Buckley court said is not allowed. That's a quality of voice. Mm -hmm. They're saying we're going to try and make everyone have a similar effect on the marketplace of ideas. And that's sort of where we are right now in the debate, I would say. You have uh, the left – more the more of the left saying that that there should be regulation for equalizing the marketplace of ideas. That person is speaking too loud. Uh, this person is, is speaking too softly. So there's one view of the First Amendment where we say that uh, the government should just stay stay out of the way. Uh, if that guy has a podium and a microphone, and and then this guy over here is doesn't have a podium and a microphone, they shouldn't get involved in trying to make sure that they both have podiums and microphones. Mm -hmm. And there's another vision of freedom of speech where you say, no, you, what you actually have to do is is buy that guy a podium and a microphone, or at least uh, not stand in the way of something that tries to equalize how loud they are speaking. It, it seems to be like these this notion here then of this kind of corruption and the equality seem awfully tangled together mm -hmm. because the the thing that – so we can't say everyone should be able to speak with equally loud voice and the government can regulate in order to do that because mm -hmm. that would be this equality standard which is out. Mm -hmm. But what we can say is you're not allowed to influence politicians by enabling them either through your own spending or by giving money to them to be louder than other people. Mm -hmm. So if you do anything that would make them louder, that's corruption. But the fact that they're louder – is an issue of equality. Well, it's, I mean, it is tangled, and I, I noticed this early, I mean, early on, the, when I was work, researching this, I mean, if you think of bribery or quid pro quo corruption, is it, it's a, a blocked exchange has been talked about. It's one that's not supposed to take place, but it's also, you could conceive it as one person has gained unequal power in a certain way that's, that's not supposed to happen. So the two get confused there, I think. The, I should mention there's other – as the time has gone on and the quid pro quo standard of quasi – looks like bribery has had difficulty coming up with much in the way of uh, 
the evidence is not overwhelming that it goes on very much. There's some evidence it does go on in some cases, but it's not a systematic problem. Other notions have come out, uh, which actually uh, other ideas of corruption. Access is talked about a lot. Now, one notion of that is that, uh, you know, and it's it, again, here's a confusion with equality, which is people who, if you're a member of Congress, for example, uh, people who give to your campaign, you're probably more likely to meet with them, maybe in your office or maybe elsewhere, or maybe you meet with uh, their representatives, with lobbyists and so on. Uh, so you're more likely to do that. So there's an inequality between, say, the average person in your district and the people, your campaign contributors. And that is thought of as, is it inequality or is it corruption? You're selling access to your... Uh, so this is a problem thought to be a problem, even if it's not... You know, it's clearly a problem if I, I meet with you and the first uh, condition is you make a contribution. And then when I meet with you, I s listen to you and say, yes, I will do what you want. Uh, that's clearly a problem. But what if I just meet with you and listen to you and think about, you know, cheeseburgers or something because I just want the money and I'm no way I'm going to do what you want? Um, it's still a problem from this point of view, the reform point of view, because the access itself has been exchanged, even with nothing happening. So that turns up in Supreme Court appointments. Uh, uh, excuse me, Supreme Court, Supreme Court appointments, too, down the line, probably, but uh, in the, these decisions, because you have to deal with... And then, so you're meeting with your supporters. Here's the response to this. How can you tell that's corrupt, right? I mean, people who are... You meet with voters, too. If a guy has a uh, control over a vote block, you've got to meet with them. You, you're more right. How is, how is saying, I will give you cash, which is, can only be used to do these things that presumably help your chances of being elected, because mm -hmm. otherwise it would be bribery of some sort. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to give you cash in exchange for you doing what I want. How is that? How can we distinguish that from saying, well, I and potentially my friends will vote for you or not based on whether you do what I want. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, mm -hmm. Is there a way to distinguish voting? Well, it's, it the difference between representation <laughs> and corruption is actually not clear. <laughs> it's very hard to draw a conceptual – I mean, you can talk to congressmen. I mean, most of them will say this, that you know, they're servants of the people. Uh, they respond to what they want. And some people might say, well, this is a problem. We need principled people in Congress. Or we need people who, who maybe will vote against their principles if they think that their constituents want them and they got enough phone calls uh, about this issue or someone met with them about this issue. What is generally the case is that no one has an equal voice in politics on some level, right? If you can just – if you know your representative, if you are a member of, of a voting bloc, you have an unequal voice compared to someone else. The bigger question is whether or not – uh, the <clears throat> attempt to equalize via government uh, creates a problem that is worse than the condition of, of having unequal voice in government. I think that unequal voice in government on some basic level is endemic to democracy. I don't think there's any way of getting away from that. What do you mean? I, I think that uh, – just what I said, that you have – different people who will have the ear of representatives more than someone else. And if you took all money out of politics, whatever that would mean, uh, if you pressed a magic button, took it all out of politics, then other people would have a more a different voice in politics. So Oprah would have a different voice in politics or the New York Times would have a different voice in politics than uh, the, the uh, big Republican spenders uh, and the big unions. They would have a different – they would have a different – equality of voice or inequality of voice. So it's kind of a question of who should have a voice in politics and what characteristics should make you have a voice in politics, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think it all, then also you get back into the mix that you've got this constitutional framework about once you recognize that money and speech are implicated and regulation is sort of tied up in all of that, then you've got this uh, Congress shall make no law uh, about freedom of speech and so you've got that to consider, too. You're not really designing a trade-off system here uh, that makes the best kind of uh, view among all these values. I want to return a little bit to the corruption issue because I think it's actually one of those sort of mind-boggling things that it's fun to think about when you're on long drives and you don't have anything <laughs> to think about, which the way it's put is this. if You know, the one notion you see so often is 
somebody voted a certain way in Congress, and you go back and look at the campaign contributions, and they're supported by interest that benefited from that vote. But then the question can be posed is this, uh, and it's based in some experience that people say in Congress, did the, the general assumption is that the money given in contributions or whatever, it could be given independently too, caused the vote. That is, the member received the money and said, I'll give you this vote implicitly. There's not, nothing explicit about it. So the money caused the vote. But the status and meaning of the money of the contribution is at issue because you can ask the question also, is it also possible that the vote caused the money? Which in a sense, you look around and you see that this guy, uh, you know. Um, has a track record. Has a track record, record or I'm trying to think of a specific example. If you think about giving to presidential candidates, right, and you look around and say, well, you know, I think Rand Paul's going to have a pretty prudent foreign policy, so I'll give money to him. Uh, well, that's the vote or the expectation about the vote or his statements and actions in Congress have caused your contribution. So how do you know which is which in, in these kinds of situations? And that's bedeviled the, the possibility or problem of trying to figure out this simple corruption. And usually what happens is, frankly, there's a real problem here of uh, distortion in analysis, which is this. If I look at a, some congressman's vote and I don't like it, I think it's just really a stupid vote or an evil vote or a harmful vote, I can't understand how anybody on earth would ever vote that way in Congress. Uh, I'm led to the conclusion, well, if that's true, maybe the only reason they would have voted that way is because bad reasons. They were given money to vote that way. So your own, uh, for many people, people's prior beliefs about what makes good public policy then sets the framework for concluding that a particular stand on politics is actually the outcome of a corrupt process. Mm -hmm. But it's the prior belief that informs that, yeah. you know, and particularly when it's intensely held, right? And these things come around usually, I don't know your experience, Trevor, but it's usually, you know, air pollution regulations or financial stuff, particularly after a financial crisis and so on. Um, it's very hard to step back because the regulatory process and its analysis is caught up in politics. Mm -hmm. It's just suffused with it. I think this is a really, really crucial point, and it's one reason why the First Amendment is a Congress shall make no law type of amendment, because I think that a lot of opinions on campaign finance can be explained by that. Uh, sometimes we sit around and we wonder, why is it that other people disagree with me? And, and you know, I'm so right. I know, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so right, so why is it that people disagree with me? And and one of our first predilections is not to maybe think that it's maybe it's not because I'm not as convincing as I think I am or my views aren't as obvious as I think they are. Um, so that's a sort of psychologically difficult thing to think. So your next thing is to think that some sort of influence is, is creating them believing in this. And I think this is pervasive in political discourse in general. There's people – so the, the left has this idea that, you know – Absent campaign finance corporations, yeah. So if we if we leveled the playing field, that's like so. There's a big part of campaign finance uh, reformers who sort of think that politics should be like you know, well, let us retire to the parlor and have a spirited discussion about the events of the day, and you get five minutes, and he gets five minutes, and we'll see who wins. Well, it's a PBS. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But so they, that's what they would like, and they think, and you have a predilection to think that if you were given an equal playing field, you would win because your ideas are so much better. And so there's an idea that the only reason that we don't have, you know, sufficient EPA controls and air pollution, all these things, is not because I'm wrong, but because the corporations are outspending. Sure. And that's true on all sides. Like right. The, the right tends to think it's teachers, university professors yeah. and the mainstream media. And, and if they all shut up, uh, therefore we would win. And I think this what? is – It's not university? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. Um, I think these are the real dangerous impulses behind campaign finance regulation that it's in a desire to achieve substantive political results. Yeah, it's a, my experience is this. I mean it's so, – I hate to in my old age be so pessimistic about everything. <laughs> but it's – I just really don't think there's a whole lot of people out there that ha are committed to First Amendment ideas and freedom of speech if it involves speech that they really find to be just kind of stupid and evil. And harmful, yeah. And harmful. If people believed it, it would be very harmful, right? That's another right, problem. That's part of the Can I ask a question about this harm? Because 
it often I, it's often my experience that reading political science, you end up finding a lot of things that that the political science community has decided has the evidence settles and it often settles things in very counterintuitive ways, like uh, economics. And, too. and yeah. so, I want to ask about something that seems very intuitive, but I just want to know if it is in fact right, which mm-hmm. is this connection between spending on campaigns and actually improving your chances of winning. So, mm-hmm. so the whole, you know, the reason we're concerned about spending on money is because it would potentially, these guys want it because it's going to improve their chances. We're going to give it to them because we think it's going to improve their chances. Mm-hmm. But does giving money to candidates or candidates spending more money actually have a significant impact on their chances of winning? Mm-hmm. This is kind of a mess, actually. The um, It started out, uh, the, the study of it started out with the, the notion that was often uh, made the observation often made and can still be made, which is that if you look at incumbents, they almost always win in Congress, and they almost always outspend their opponents by a lot. But the que- the problem was, you know, uh, it's not always the case that that happened, and so you were really trying to figure out how much more of a uh, of a kind of uh, Effect. advantage or effect yeah. they got out of additional spending because you could I mean incumbents that are in trouble spend a lot of money but they, they lose and it's very difficult to say actually they've had a hard time unwinding all of it about the a- additional advantages you have now a lot of it this we were just uh, had this couple of uh, authors who studied the 2012 election John uh, Sidis this, this book on the 2012 election and they, their conclusion was that, uh, and I think this is a fairly common notion, as long as both sides are roughly equal, so you, you reach a sort of level of equality, the actual campaigns themselves, including the spending on them, doesn't have much effect on the outcome. It's, mm-hmm. it's circumstances and stuff that has a big effect. Yeah. And we saw that, too, with the, the, the amounts of money spent by uh, was Sheldon Adelson, is that his name? Yeah. yeah. And the Koch brothers and everyone so else. So soon forgotten. And, and, uh, and, and the union spent an unbelievable amount to combat the Michigan uh, initiative uh, to amend the Constitution to allow a right-to-work legislation, and they lost that too. Uh, it's not the case that money always buys elections. There was this interesting recent case too that in the uh, – from you guys are out of Colorado, I understand, for part of your lives, and the, well, they had this recall fight about gun control basically uh, – and that was a odd. I mean, the other thing is a counterintuitive uh, inequality, which was that the gun control forces put a lot of emphasis on this. So they spent about three million dollars defending these candidates against recall, and the uh, NRA or whatever forces had much less money to spend. And of course, the the recalls went through, and it's a, one of them narrowly, but still. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of examples of this kind of thing depending on circumstances. The other point I would make here is that it has been established, I think, is that challengers don't need to spend as much money in the end on, on in Congress on uh, races. They need to spend enough to be able to make it a race. So the mm-hmm. typical problem you have is connected to safe districts in general elections in Congress. So you end up with somebody – a congressman spending a million, two million dollars, but the problem is the other guy spends um, fifty thousand or whatever, which then leads you to. There's another element to all of this, which is the how much people raise and how much they spend is not independent of the candidates. Right. So if the can if the incumbent seems weak or it seems like a bad year is coming, think about 2010 or 2006 for the the Republicans. Um, people, whatever the money situation is, people tend to feel like the better candidates, candidates with experience and some attraction to the uh, the electorate, tend to feel like they might make a challenge to an incumbent candidate. So when they do that, their quality means they get more money. What's not often noted is the people who end up with fifty thousand dollars and losing by fifty points are all safe poor. districts. Yeah, or, yeah poor in, candidates and safe districts. It's a bad start because it's a safe district. It's not a good year. The challenge is unlikely. The best candidates are going to stay out. So you get a weak candidate, and then nobody is going to give a weak candidate money because they're expected to lose. There's this, you know, sort of cascade of factors that uh, mean that you end up with. Incumbents, in, but incumbents who are in trouble, incumbents who come in at fifty-three percent in the last race, the evidence is that you can raise money to make a fight with them. 
uh, if you and that you'll get fairly decent candidates if there's any members of the party in your yeah, and that's pretty important too because the there's a diminishing marginal gains on, cam- on campaign campaign spending. Uh, so that's the other point which is important to bring up because people may be wondering, well, you know, why wouldn't you want to regulate campaign spending even mm-hmm. if there's a small chance or not that pr- pronounced chance of corruption uh, and. The, the reason that, that I'm against it and, and you're against it, 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 there are huge costs. In addition to there being a First Amendment that's pretty straightforward, mm-hmm. there are huge costs to campaign finance regulation that a lot of people don't really talk about. And so one of them is incumbent protection. Mm-hmm. And that's what we have. So if you think about trying, so you you think about trying to unseat an incumbent, mm-hmm. and uh, so you have a diminishing gains on what you could, you spend in your election. Um, the first five hundred thousand a challenger spends, let's say. Uh, sort of puts them up to parity with an incumbent because you can think of an incumbent as having already spent the money. Mm -hmm. And if they decide to hold a press press conference, they have name recognition, they have so many things at advantage. So the first $500,000 might get you to parity with the incumbent where you can hold a press conference and people will come and people will recognize your name. And then after that, you you know, we can spend up to maybe $1.5 million. But if you spend $50 million, it's not going to do that much for you compared to that first 500,000 and then the next 500,000 but the dem- the gains will be diminishing over time mm-hmm. but so one of the things that campaign finance regulation does by making it harder to raise money in a variety of different ways is it prefers incumbents uh, it make it, it's their they don't have to raise as much money if you make it harder on their competition it's kind of like uh, big business regulation the incumbents are the big businesses and they get less hurt by the regulation than the small guys who are trying to compete against the big business no, I think that's right. And Brad Smith, some years back when they were setting, I think, uh, contribution limits in a public financing scheme or something, calculated that the actual numbers were about, you know, just below the limits on for both candidates would be just below what a challenger needed to, to be successful. You know, the one thing that struck me recently, though, is there's some times there's an argument about arms control, right, which is that, you know, well... These people, particularly when you have an expensive Senate race where you could have twenty million dollars spent on both sides, if uh, you know if you need to be even and then that both sides will have a chance in an even race. Actually, if you both sides spend ten million in that hypothetical Senate race, the challenger would actually probably be better off. Would certainly have enough money. Why don't you just have regulations that bring just like an arms control pack? We we you know feel secure with ten percent of the nuclear weapons we have. Why not bring it down to one million or whatever the number is? So it seems like a good argument without any big effects on one side or the other. The, pro- the interesting thing about that argument is, so in other words, with Obama and uh, uh, Mitt Romney, why why not instead of spending a billion each, why don't they just you know like public yeah. financing have a couple hundred yeah. million save money? Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, and there's a libertarian element here too, which is. Do we really want to waste all this money on political campaigning? It's politics after all and all that. The problem is, the odd thing is the costs there are really democratic costs in the sense that there is some fairly strong evidence that, and not surprising evidence, that the more money that's spent on campaigns, the better informed the voters are. Yeah, and people may think differently about that because uh, going back to what we were talking about, thinking that people are duped by campaign finance spending, yeah. uh, I still there are people out there uh, who think that, you know, they, they see, a, let's say, they're Obama supporters, and they see a Romney ad, and they say, "Oh you know, man, who would who would who would believe that?" You know, that's it's completely wrong. Uh, but they think that there are people out there who see the Romney ad and say, "Oh yes, I will now vote for Romney." And it's like a robotic response to it. But what actually happens with campaign ads is you see it, and maybe you go and research further about it, and maybe you write an op-ed about it, and someone mm-hmm. writes an op-ed in, in response to it, or mm-hmm. a letter to the editor. Uh, very, very few people see a campaign ad and just decide that they're going to believe it automatically, right? Well, this goes back to Aaron's question about what are the effects of money, actually, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, the the idea, you're right, is that you spend a lot on, on advertising, and as a result, you end up with people who are voting against their own interests. And again, this is, even at the social science level, it's not wholly uh, implausible initially because... People don't know a lot about politics, and there's always been this question whether people could gain enough information. But surely, first thing is you don't want to limit spending because people will become more informed. That's that's the evidence. And it's also true, I think, that the likelihood, uh, particularly now, of moving people off their partisan priors, 
prior beliefs. For people over 20 or 25, yeah, in particular. it's very, very hard. I mean, I, I just from, um, in other words, the duping argument uh, right. is I, not very. The duping common. argument has always struck me as interesting because it seems to, it seems to always, always be about other people besides the person making the argument. Mm-hmm. So there's this, so there's these, it seems like there's two types of corruption going on in this conversation. There's the, the corrupting of politicians where you know we're saying look we'll, we'll give you money or support you in this way if then once you're in office you'll vote in ways we like mm-hmm. but then there's also you hear a lot of rhetoric about the corrupting of the political process and the elections themselves or the so corrupting that, of minds right yeah. so that if if only we had limited the spending of these guys then the right people would have gotten elected mm-hmm. and that gets to this that's where the duping argument comes in is is there's this notion that the the voters Somehow, you know, if they just – if they see a whole lot more ads for one guy, then they're just going to fall in line behind that guy. And so we need to limit the number of ads. And this seems to present kind of a – I mean a particular picture of the American voter as someone who is almost mindless and will just do what he or well, she sees on TV. It's also the, the sort of metaphor about inequality and equality, which is that one guy has the megaphone and so they're only hearing that. And, you know, I mean, today that's especially not true, I think. The other question that's implicit here, which to me is in some ways the most dispiriting in a way, because I like to think that ideas matter. But I, you know, I posed a question myself is, does, if, does anyone really care about the process? I mean, on its surface, campaign finance reform presents as a like process reforms, mm-hmm. right? The The American elections and what follows in policy making thereafter has some fault. It's corrupt or it's unequal or whatever. And, you know, by fixing it, reforming it, you would fix the process and you'd make have a better process. Make it more fair, yeah. Yeah, you'd make it more fair and you'd have a better process. And all of this seems at this point, I haven't said anything about who wins elections or what but kind ideas of policies you make yeah. and all that stuff. However, people seem intensely interested about, uh, you know. Outcomes. Outcomes. And things that happen that... Uh, would have caused a conniption fit uh, if the other party did it. And the biggest example here is Barack Obama in 2008, I think. Um, And I should say that this point is actually bipartisan. There is a a striking partisanship about campaign finance reform for or against it. Democrats mostly, I like to say it's in their DNA and in their activists. So, but Barack Obama, you know, is the greatest fundraiser in the history of the republic. And he set records, and, and all, but most in, in 2008. But also, he uh, essentially, the, the public financing system was in deep trouble and was dying, and he simply finished it off in 2008, which normally would be a high crime and misdemeanor. Well, he said he, w- he, he said he would participate in it and then went back on it. Uh, and for, then to remind her. Yeah. polished it off for very well understood political reasons. Uh, and but that's that okay because it's Barack Obama, right? <laughs> it, it, yeah, there wasn't. A, there were some complaints. To be fair, some people yes, uh, focus on the process, but it wasn't very much. And as I said, this this Colorado gunfight in which you had big money coming in. A lot of it from Michael Bloomberg. Michael Bloomberg, yeah. And again, that was not. Has any even people listening to this podcast? Have you heard about that? The three million spent out there. Well, it's not really worrisome in the same way. It seems that people really are concerned about money and they're concerned about the things that are connected to it, which is a particular set of political views. And to be fair, so often, you know, I would say with Mitch McConnell, um, I think over time he fairly quickly became an actual advocate uh, and believer in the First Amendment despite the outcomes. But for a lot of conservative Republicans and others, and maybe maybe some libertarian less likely there, I think. It's really about, you know... Well, control the unions now. <laughs> yeah, they want to control the unions. They wanted to eliminate PACs at one point yeah, in the yeah. 90s and so on. It's very... It's it's partisan very, outcomes. It's very unclear. The, uh, the, I think it's a good way to segue into the, uh, the actual substantive, what you're talking about, the substantive motives to influence the outcomes of political debate into Citizens United, mm-hmm. which uh, you know, is the rogues gallery of Supreme Court opinions now. And one way that I always sort of – very rarely do you find someone – they exist who's a campaign finance reformer who <clears throat> attacks money spending on both sides equally. So 
You had Senator uh, Durbin uh, recently attack ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, in sort of an underhanded way. He sent a letter to Cato. Our President John Allison responded to the Wall Street Journal asking about ALEC supporting stand your ground laws uh, via money in the states. Um, so he thought this was sort of illegitimate that someone would be supporting a stand your ground law in the states, where at the same time Bloomberg is pledged to spend millions and millions of dollars to to reform gun laws in the states. Now, if you were if you're just an honest person who thought money in politics was a bad thing, you would say you know Bloomberg is also a problem here. And similarly speaking, in the Citizens United decision, which we should have John explain what that was, but it applies to corporations and unions. And usually you just hear corporations. And that, and that always shows to me that, that they are only concerned about one side of the speech and not the other side of the speech. But to some extent that, I mean, psychologically makes sense because if your concern in all this is corruption and whether we're talking <clears> about corrupting the elections or corrupting politicians – Corruption is always something that's in a bad direction, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. we never we never corrupt things into the direction that they ought to go. Mm-hmm. And so if you – like all of us think that your views are right, you know, because if you didn't think your views are right, then you wouldn't hold them. Mm-hmm. So we're predisposed to believe we're right. Um, and you think that people who – That's not very liberal. <laughs> you think that people who then agree with you are also right. And so their money therefore is not – you know, spreading correct ideas is not – Corruption. Mm-hmm. It's it's yeah. fixing the system, and yeah. so it's therefore not corruption when Bloomberg spends money in favor of gun control. If you think that gun control is correct, and it is corruption if you're spending money to stop gun control. It's, it's it hadn't struck me before that this is sort of like the version of behavioral economics, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But it's behavioral politics. It's sort of like the founders understood that we are uh, not corrupt, but you know, kind of Bias. limited. And you know, and distorted and mm-hmm. biased in our assessment, and therefore, uh, you're not going to get good legislation about speech that's trying to do something in the general interest. Yeah. People are going to be doing it for distorted uh, through distorted analysis and reasoning. So you just put it off political speech. You put off uh, the the uh, calendar, yeah. and that that strikes me as making a lot of sense. Yeah, in particular because. I think people's worries about even spending uh, advantages are probably uh, mistaken in mm-hmm. the sense that they it's, it matters a lot. I had a friend, a very outstanding scholar uh, at the University of Man- Massachusetts Amherst, Ray LaRaja, who I remember him when I first knew him and he was beginning his studies, said something like, well, you know, matter, money just doesn't matter that much. And what he meant by that is, you know, at the end of the day, uh, and I think you see, I've seen like sort of liberal democratic uh, professors or uh, professionals saying about campaign finance reform, you know, even if you put all the stuff aside, I just don't think we got that much out of it, just Mm -hmm. hard-boiled political point of view. Uh, and if money doesn't matter that much, then that's what you would expect. I mean, it's the economy, it's wars, it's maybe candidates, it's the skill of the operation, and, and so on. Uh, and I think that's probably where it is. So people have these Democrats, in particular, have a, a long-standing fear that corporate coffers, these general funds of bi- huge businesses, would be spent almost exclusively on campaigns, or huge sums would come in. Uh, and so there has been some spending, but again, you're talking about, and Trevor and I made this point, and we'll continue to make this point. I mean, at the end of the day, it's five or six billion dollars overall. The presidential election was two billion. The economy is huge. The government itself is, spends trillions of dollars, and trying to I, see I, the problem here is one that no one talks about because it's so boring, which <laughs> is. You know, a central issue is how do you fund elections? Yeah. And if the government's – you're not going to tax to do it, then what are you going to do here? And also, of course, do we want the people who get elected uh, to be in charge of the elections? Should we have the fox guard in the hen house, so to speak? Should they regulate the campaigns that they are I, – the refer- I think the referee analogy of having re- the referees in games in which they are competing. Uh, and that should give us a lot more – a concern that it does. It, it is weird. The public opinion on campaign finance over the years hasn't changed much. It's mm-hmm. uh, it still has a positive uh, 
the idea of reform, campaign finance reform, has a positive spin to and, it. And maybe that's, again, just playing into these you know, biases of of thinking that your ideas would win out if, if it was reformed properly. But I think it's good. So you mentioned cor- corporation spending, and I briefly mentioned Citizens United. Uh, I think we should probably mention that and mm-hmm. talk about what that actually – what that case was about and what it actually held because there's an amazing amount of misinformation out there about what Citizens United stands for. So, mm-hmm. John, would you uh, fill us in on that? Well, Citizens United was dealing with a case uh, and as it happened, federal rules that prohibited uh, corporate spending independent uh, on elections. But Now, what I mean – this is – We've got a 50-year legal history here, so all these things have meaning. Uh, it was a, a ban on spending by businesses as businesses uh, from their general coffers, uh, independent of campaigns. That is, you could just – the example that had been upheld by the Supreme Court in the 1980s was from Detroit uh, or from Michigan, in which uh, I guess General Motors had um, – wanted to run an ad for a House member, a House candidate. And then basically the ads paid for by the corporation said, this candidate will create, you know, a bunch of list of issues, will create a better monetary environment or economic environment and so on. And Michigan law banned them from doing that because they, there was this notion that um, campaigns would be corrupted by big money of a, the, these kinds of institutions, Right. And so Michigan had done that, and the, in the late 80s, the Supreme Court upheld it, saying that it was really, I think, what happened was, in the context of our discussion and otherwise, was the court had the language of corruption, but they were really concerned about equality. They were concerned that these corporations have so many resources that they will just dominate our elections and you really won't have fair elections. So that was the underlying motivation, but they had to use the language of corruption. So you ended up with a a notion of corruption that was really inequality. So Citizens United essentially reconsidered the matter in a different context where uh, essentially an interest group took the corporate form. And the United States' legal system, a lot of political organizations and similarly situated organizations take the corporate form. And they had spent money on a movie, part of which had come from corporations. Um, attacking uh, Hillary Clinton, basically. It was a, this is another whole thing about it. The quality of speech is a big issue here. But that, this was, you know, was shocked the justices, I think. And the, there had been this long-going fight for over a decade or more about um, these issues. And finally, it was decided in Citizens United that uh, the federal Congress could not do that, so that there had they could not ban that kind of speech. Mm-hmm. And, and they, I mean, the big important thing is that they reaffirmed that equality is not at play here, and this is what made people so upset. And I think if we revisit the Austin case, the, the Michigan Chamber mm-hmm. of Commerce case, which yes. is the one John mentioned, what you see in that, when you see the justices conflating corruption with equality, which is what happens all the time now, mm-hmm. every time you hear people talk about campaign finance, they talk about corrupting our our, our political system, but they don't usually mean buying politicians. They usually mean speaking too loudly or, you know, corrupting the minds of people or whatever. Or having too much power. Or having too much influence. Yeah. But, of course, they, they, don't, they don't include Oprah or the New York Times. They just include some people who have too much power, which is one reason why this is so wrong. In, in that case, the Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce case, which Citizens United overruled, uh, Contra, which is, only, which is only 20 years old at the time, Contra to Barack Obama saying that it was a century of precedent mm-hmm. that they overruled. Um, Thurgood Marshall in the Austin case said that this law, the law that prohibited corporations in Michigan, aims at a different type of corruption, the corruption that occurs when uh, an entity that gets uh, un- gains from the business world spends it in the political world. And they spend it in a way that is not uh, – co-equal with the amount of support that those ideas have in society. And that was the one that always made me scratch my head because it sort of said the government is involved, they're in charge of figuring out how many people believe something in society and then making sure that people aren't spending too much disproportionately with the with the steady state so of this would opinions. prohibit people from seeking to change minds? Basically, yeah. It's like it, it's, it's that uh, like there's something – You can only talk if people already agree with you. Exactly. Or you can only talk as loud as the people who agree with you. And, that, and that's why 
why it's hard to come up with any coherent principle that would not be just complete politics uh, to to you know make that into a test of any sort. Mm-hmm. And that's what the the court had to deal with was that rationale in Citizens United. They did not help hold that corporations are people. Uh, corporations have been legal persons for years and years. That, and it's a good thing, too, because if they weren't, you know, the Fourth Amendment wouldn't apply. They could just go in and take all your medical records. The Fifth Amendment eminent domain clause wouldn't apply. They could just take the property of, let's say, churches, which are often corporations, uh, just take that property. Uh, you know, and many people supported this, and this became such a huge thing for the left because the left has become, you know, so anti-corporate. I mean, mm-hmm. that's sort of almost the driving thing: corporations mm-hmm. versus everyone else. Mm-hmm. And but the, you know, they're always surprised. I, I find that you know people who don't know a lot about the case that the ACLU supported uh, Citizens United that case. The Sierra, the Sierra Club. Uh, which had which is a corporation had been cited a couple times by the Federal Election Commission for for violating these laws where they're speaking within 30 or 60 days of an election. They they were also in support of Citizens United, and so they just simply hold that there's nothing that that allows the government to regulate the equality of speech. It, that turns the First Amendment from a limitation on power into an empowering object in some weird sense that, that we, we shouldn't trust politicians and, and people who are limited by our own biases, as John pointed out, that we shouldn't trust them to do this. We mm-hmm. should just have a complete you know, ban on, on these kind of laws. Well, this, uh, you know, it strikes me that uh, this is for uh, libertarianism.org uh, talking about Austin uh, it struck me that uh, that could be an outgrowth of Michael Walter's work that mm-hmm. we've discussed uh, among ourselves at times. I mean, that maybe what Marshall was in some way getting at was the idea that he wanted, you know, the economic sphere was the economic sphere and it has a certain logic to it. And then the political sphere is supposed to be separate and it's not supposed to be boundary crossing. Yeah, and that's and to, to fill, Michael Walter has a book called Spheres of Justice, right. which has some really interesting ideas, at least in the beginning of it, about how you know, generally speaking, we think that we shouldn't have, you know, the, the guy, if the girl that I'm super into, if she goes to the guy with the nicest car, I get kind of upset because having a car shouldn't be the what gets you girls. And and so similarly speaking, but that, I mean, like, it's, it's, a, so, yeah, it's, it's exactly a, the same. It's, a, it's, a, members, it's so. an overlap of yeah, a, Walter's, a, Walter's idea is that you can have within certain spheres, so within the sphere of business or within the sphere of cool cars yeah, right. or whatever else, you can have inequalities. Some people can have more power, more whatever, mm-hmm. but that inequalities in one sphere of conduct should not carry over into another sphere. Just mm-hmm. because you're super powerful in sphere A doesn't mean, should not mean that you're more powerful than other people in sphere B. And I think mm-hmm. that that's a very, very compelling and intuitively compelling argument, mm-hmm. but you have to transfer it over to governance and say, and show that, you know, People don't always believe that in the same way. Like I brought up Oprah in the New York Times, but but as I said uh, earlier in, the, in, in this discussion, there are many unequal ways that people can influence politics, and they can transfer something from one sphere to the other sphere. Mm-hmm. And so Oprah gets a lot of power, you know, giving cars and promoting books, and then has a ton of political power. Mm-hmm. And then the New York Times gets a lot of power from good reporting, and then its editorial page has a lot of power. So unless you can, you know, I, I totally think the Spheres of Justice idea has a lot of appeal, but the, the you have to be able to apply it equally and coherently and with principle, or don't apply it at all, I would mm-hmm. say. The, you know, it just struck me as you were speaking, another issue here, too, about the talking about reformers and the left. I mean, I think they probably, of course, with them, uh, a growing inequality is always a big issue, and and it's one of their uh, central arguments these days. But one of the odd things about campaign finance regulation is, if you think about it, if you compare the period in America, the growing uh, inequality they cite is also uh, during the period of campaign finance regulation. So the golden age they look back to was an age when there was formal uh, like the 60s and 50s, was an a, the golden age of more equality was also an age when there was very little regulation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There was, uh, and even the regulations that existed, like uh, disclosure, were pretty much ignored. And mm-hmm. so everything, it's true that lots of different things have changed over those two. Uh, 
uh, eras, but it, it doesn't strike me that it's obvious that regulation is going to help you with those well, issues. I think that brings up a good point about, um, uh, you know, we've used the Eugene McCarthy story. We, uh, we, I mean, John and I are talking about campaign finance stuff uh, uh but we, we use it all the time, and it might be getting tired. Uh, People so, forget who it so, was. So yeah. the Eugene McCarthy story is a story about the 1968 presidential election where it, Lyndon Johnson is you know, fighting a very unpopular war in Vietnam, and the mainstream Democrats are generally supporting that. Eugene McCarthy is a, is a quite left uh, senator, um, or is it a congressman? He was, was a uh, senator. He was an odd left guy. I mean, it, as we think of... We've all become, I guess, more uh, uh, coherent in the times. But McCarthy had, you know, these odd things about him. And he was from the North. He was I an think old Yankee. And he was kind of like, I mean, maybe like Denis Kucinich. He was very anti-war. So he decided to challenge a sitting Democrat president for the nomination. I mean, the analogy here, that usually doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, no one challenged Barack Obama for the nomination. And so he decided to challenge challenge him, and he got... He had about six hundred thousand dollar ish campaign donations because he had different ideas. He had he wanted to rock the boat, and he had different ideas, and therefore he 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 didn't he couldn't get a very wide set of like small contributions. And this was before contribution limits. Mm-hmm. He could just get six people who really supported him. So he gets this this you know good good amount of money to go to the primary in New Hampshire, get a bunch of hippies to get clean for Gene and then they uh, got clean for Gene. They got <laughs> yeah, they got clean for Gene. They cut their hair and they went door to door and he didn't win the New Hampshire primary, but he came really close, close okay. enough to make Lyndon Johnson withdraw from the election. So the other thing about this is that camp contribution limits and other types of reform and independent expenditure regulations and all these different types of laws, they tend to make political opinion less diverse. Uh, they water down political discourse in sort of mm-hmm. a basic way. Everyone sort of sits in the bell curve. Um, and, so there, and so going back to your point about, you know, back when there was the, their golden age of, of less inequality generally in society mm-hmm. was also no campaign finance regulation. More and more people are moving to the middle in political ideas. You know, they say, oh, the Democrats and Republicans are the same. There could be a campaign finance reason for that. Uh, because if someone wants to rock the boat, they can't get someone to give them a ton of money uh, to to come up with a new idea. Uh, well, until Citizens United. Until Citizens yeah. United, yeah. Yeah, and you now, you now, I mean, we do now live in a period of no contribution. Limits. Yeah, and I make the analogy of, of uh, you know, if we all got together and decided we were going to have a national album, like we are going to choose a national CD album, and everyone could just buy one. Um, and so whoever sold the most at the end would, would – be able to win the national mm-hmm. album. Well, everyone would, would start the, – the bands that were competing would run to the middle and they'd make the most insipid album of, you know, watered down, uh, you know, just pop stuff uh, because no one could support a band more because everyone can just buy one. And it's similar in politics. So, Yeah, that's a good point. So I think the takeaway from all of this, at least the big one, is campaign finance has a ton of issues and they're all – much more complicated and subtle than a lot of the argument about them. Yeah, I'd say don't, be. don't believe the hype. Yeah. We've been around and around this. It's not just people of bad will cause problems. There's real issues, and you've got to be willing to trade off free speech. I, if you want to do that and you want to have equality, I, you know, I would challenge you just to face what you are doing. It's not you're actually doing something that runs counter to the regime mm-hmm. and the Constitution. You may want to do it. I, I admire Jeff Stone, who's a law professor, that says, yeah, it, you know, speech implicates money, but we need more equality, and we need to make that trade-off. Okay. I'll be clear about it, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah but there's a philo- so the philosophical under, underpinnings of the whole thing, freedom versus equality, regulating the marketplace for fairness, and then also these biases. Another thing, the, the, you know, some of the background motives the, about why we might want to regulate campaign finance. And one, just one thing we should add, for Trevor and I, which is, if you want to do that, if you want to be Jeff Stone, you better you should actually put something in the Constitution or cl- clarify the Fourteenth Amendment so that it does apply. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would want that step, but I think just when you're thinking about it at home, you should you know do that. But don't believe the hype. Things are really are, and serious people of both parties and all ideologies who have looked at this, it's very complicated. It's a populist issue that is uh, not pa- well served uh, by populists. Pass the ball back and forth between populists and, and uh, yeah, not yep. well served. 
Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments, you can find me on Twitter at A Ross P. That's A R O S S P. And me on Twitter at T C Burris, B U R R U S. To learn more about the issues we discussed today or about the theory and history of liberty, you can find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.